uh, go to the Lord in prayer and prepare our hearts to uh, hear the word. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we, uh, we love you. We thank you for the, the opportunity to come together and study your word, Lord. Uh, have, have us uh, today uh, tune our hearts with the Holy Spirit to hear what you'd have us hear, to apply uh, what uh, you would have us apply to our lives, Lord, as we uh, look into um, uh, an ancient people, an ancient people that, um, that, that carry with them uh, the same uh, flaws that we carry with us. And we thank you for uh, the, um, the solution to that flaw, Lord, your Son, Jesus Christ, and the perfect sacrifice for our sin. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to travel back some 2,200 years or so before Christ. Um, I was thinking about it on the way uh, to church this morning. Um, uh, if you're looking at uh, biblical history, uh, the, the, uh, the time that we're looking at, that somewhere, what, you know, 240-year window uh, for when the Tower of Babel story would have occurred, um, happened about the same amount of time before Christ as we are living after Christ. So, uh, you know, you can, uh, I don't know if that's a curiosity of yours or not, but uh, we're thinking it's probably somewhere in the uh, 2250 uh, B.C. range is the, the time period we look, we're looking at. And so let's, uh, let's pick up and, and look at uh, uh, where we left off with uh, our population at Babel in the land of Shinar. When we left them, they were building bricks. Uh, they were harvesting asphalt, troweling asphalt. Uh, building up their city, building up their tower. They were building their city for socioeconomic aspirations, uh, to take care of their physiological needs, to take care of their security needs. Um, that, that, was, that was their city. Uh, they could politically control the population, who goes in, who goes out, um, in order for them to engage in, I'll call this, extra work, uh, which would have been a construction of a tower and construction of the city, uh, that means they had some. They had to have some level of discretionary time, so they would not have been completely subsistence uh, type existence at this point. Um, uh, so they they had to have had uh, uh, some degree of 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 of, um, of, of farming, uh, so that they could provision themselves uh, to be able to carry on uh, these activities. So they are building up their city. Okay, a city that we actually see in the prior chapter uh, being the beginning or the uh, headquarters, the capital of Nimrod's kingdom. That would be Babel. They are then building a tower, a tower to, yes sir. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, Genesis 11. Genesis 11. My apologies there. Yeah, we're in Genesis 11. Uh, we, we, we may hit a few verses today uh, in Psalms and maybe one in Romans, but uh, uh, pretty much we're going to be parked here today. Now next week, uh, we're going to tie this into uh, uh, a lot of prophecy as well. But um, uh, today we'll be mainly hanging out in Genesis chapter 11. Uh, we'll be focusing on verses 5 through 9. So they're building a tower, a tower that, uh, uh, according to the language, is by, near, towards heaven. Uh, this is to satisfy their religious uh, aspirations, their, their need to connect to a divine. We know that eternity has been instilled in the hearts of man. They are searchers, so they are doing what you would expect them to do. They are searching. This would have been fulfilling their needs of love and belonging. It would have given them a focal point around their civilization to rally towards something at, at, at a high level that they could always see no matter where they are on their on their um, uh, on the plain of Shinar they'll be able to look up and and, and find uh, their destination um, it is entirely possible and actually I believe this even though scripture doesn't say this uh, that uh, it might have actually started for sincere purposes you might have actually uh, uh, coalesced around a project here uh, that was originally designed to worship uh, or pay homage to, to adore the true God. But as we know, in worldly systems, Satan uh, gets himself uh, uh, involved in that, and Satan, we know, is a great deceiver. He's a great uh, confuser. Um, he, he distorts uh, that which is the truth. Uh, for us, and with our sin nature, we so quickly want to follow along uh, with that distortion. So 
Uh, they're building this tower. Uh, many commentators, uh, archaeologists believe you're looking at a ziggurat type staircasing structure, rectangular or square at the base um, with, uh, with, with stepping uh, uh, step uh, stones that would be going up. Um, although it is, is pretty clear from, from that point of history and what we know about their religious activities that actually it was less of a stairway to heaven and more of a stairway for the gods to descend to commune with the people. That would have been uh, their intent. So we, we know very quickly that the, the, tower, the population at Babel was deeply already involved in idolatry, um, as the, and, and actually a lot of the ziggurats, in fact all the 30 ziggurats that we know of in, in Mesopotamia, would have had some relationship with the zodiac. Now, uh, it wasn't so long ago the pastor was uh, uh, preaching about the uh, passage in Isaiah um, and how the zodiac, uh, or not, not the zodiac, but the stars declare God's majesty. There's no doubt that it, that it does. Okay, But Satan, in his efforts to distort that which is biblical, that which is truth, can often uh, uh, yield up a, a, a false doctrine uh, that is just close enough to tr true doctrine that can lead people astray. It would not surprise me at all if uh, the, the, the stars do tell a story and that that story has become distorted through worldly systems, mainly uh, through the, uh, the, the, the work of Satan and his, his legions of demons. We kn I mean, you need, you know, you, you, we need no long, to look no further than just a couple of chapters ago in Genesis we know that the rainbow has been given as a sign of God's provision and God's mercy, of God's deliverance, God's promise, okay? And yet, that very symbol has been distorted even in our modern society. But it is clear that they've fallen into idolatry, and they're building this city, they're building this tower um, with the intent of making a name for themselves. Their self-worth at the center of their activity uh, they, they're looking for self-esteem, they are looking for fame, they are looking for legacy, uh, they are looking for what Abraham Maslow would say would be self-actualization, but they are into self-glorification and self-exaltation. And they were able to do this because they were all unified. They were unified in their language, they were unified in their project, they were unified project, uh, most likely in their project management, uh, but they are unified in their vision for self-glorification. Now, this is Greg's opinion, this is what, what I believe, this is not in Scripture, um, but this is what I believe because, quite frankly, God does not operate from a standpoint of chaos. So I believe that not only did this population know that they had been told to be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth, that God had actually revealed to them, probably through Noah, the preacher of righteousness, where they were to go. I think there was an orderly plan, divine plan, that was in front of them, and they said no. Nope, nope, nope. We're going to settle right here. But I believe that God had a master plan for where they were to go and that they said no. Um, they've got a better plan. So, honestly, I would love to see this made into a major motion picture. Wouldn't you? This would be cool. This would be one of the biblical stories of a motion picture that I would be enticed to watch. Because I've already got the soundtrack for it. Okay? Obviously, obviously you'd have to, you know, maybe the intro music would be, you know, Robert Plant and Jimmy Page and, and the Stairway to Heaven. You'd, you'd, you'd have to go there, you know, to, and, and apparently Chip likes, Chip likes that one. Um, and then, uh, then you'd, I, I think somewhere there you'd have to have uh, some modern version of Heaven Came Down. Okay? That would, that would be in there. Um, uh, uh, Christmas song, Come Let Us Adore Him, uh, would, would, be, would be in there. Um, the one that I the, the one that we'll talk about today, because this is, uh, you know, I'm into comeuppances, and and you get it in, in in verses five through nine. But there's a group called POD who I used to play a lot when I was uh, uh, doing public address for uh, Alito football. Okay, and POD has a song called "Here Comes the Boom." It's a great football song. 
Okay, I mean, it, and you even see it play, hear it played a lot in in, a, in, a, in association with all these massive tackles, these you know helmet rattling tackles, and so and it's a, here comes the boom. Well, today we're going to get here comes the boom. Okay, so we're going to get that. Uh, but uh, when the credits are running, I think that I would probably play Elton John's song appropriately titled "Tower of Babel." Um, in fact, let me. Um, let me uh, read the lyrics, or some of the lyrics, uh, to Elton John's song here. Um, it says, Snow, cement, and ivory young towers, someone called us Babylon, those hungry hunters. You think, you think, and by the way, Elton John did not write this song. This was written for him. Tracking down the hours, but where all your shoulders, where, where were all your shoulders when we cried? We're darlings on the sideline, dreaming up such cherished lies to whisper in your ear before you die. Now listen to this. This is the, uh, this is the chorus. Anybody familiar with this song, by the way? Not, not this one? Yeah. Um, it's not nearly as pop- popular as Elton John's Daniel. Okay. But that's where we're going next, is to the book of Daniel. But listen to this chorus. It's party time for the guys in the Tower of Babel. Sodom meet Gomorrah. Cain meet Abel. Have a ball, y'all. See the leches crawl with the call girls under the table. Watch them dig their graves and listen to this line. Because Jesus don't save the guys in the Tower of Babel. Wrong. Wrong. Jesus died for all. Jesus died for all. And so while I'm all into comeuppances and here comes the booms and stuff like that, I think for a moment I have to take a a look at myself here. Because is it not amazing that this population so quickly removed from God's deliverance and a universal flood has so quickly fallen into idolatry and is, is, is relying on themselves and their ingenuity and their talents and their, their intellect and, and their, uh, their uh, uh, faux religions constructed completely out of, out, of, out of whole cloth on things that are seen, but not uh, 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 rather than the, the, the uncaused cause that can't be seen? Isn't, it's, that's amazing until I start thinking about things like myself. And I think about how often I glory in my own ingenuity, my intellect, my work ethic. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I've been blessed with uh, so many things uh, that are obviously gifts from God, but then I lean into my own self-sufficiency, how quickly it infests even me. So in, in the people of the Tower of Babel, I think we can all see ourselves. And I think this is also why the Apostle John, when we, if we remember back to 1 John, talks about this need for restoration of fellowship through the confession of sin. Because what these guys were doing was sinning. Okay? Was sinning. But Jesus died for them too, as he did for each of us. So, at Babel, we begin to see this worldview come into, come into perspective. Right? We begin to see it, how they, they're talking about their destiny, they're talking about their, their morality, how they should behave, what they should do, what their purpose is, uh, their aspirations of creating a name for himself. And now, we saw verses 1 through 4, now 5 through 9, it's God's turn. The kingdom of man is being built, and now we're going to see how the kingdom of God reacts to this. And it's a one-act play. It's just one act. We don't even need an intermission here. We reach the midpoint or the fulcrum of this story, which is in verse 5, and it starts out appropriately, the Lord came down. The Lord came down. That is the covenant name right there. That is Jehovah God. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. Some of your translations may say we're building. Some may say builded, actually which is an interesting, uh, an interesting translation, and quite frankly, probably the, the accurate one. The Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all the same language. And this is what they began to do, and now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down, 
and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of the whole earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. And that is the sum story of the Tower of Babel. It's nine short verses stuck right in the middle of the table of nations and the genealogy leading up to Abraham. So, when you see the Lord came down, this is an example of anthropomorphism, okay? This is actually, I believe, Moses using language that mocks the puny efforts of man. Okay, this is not the, not the same thing as, you know, uh, as, as Jesus Christ coming down incarnate. The, 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 it's not an incarnation it's a, a, a symbol of the Lord has taken notice, and he had to come down to take notice. So, I mean, anthropomorphism is merely the assigning of human characteristics to that which is a non-human entity. You can think of uh, a cricket named Jiminy, okay, that uh, sat on shoulders and, and, and talked. That's anthropomorphism. Or a horse named Ed, okay? Uh, that would be an example of uh, anthropomorphism. Uh, but here, human characteristics are given to Almighty God, Jehovah God, the national God of, of Israel. Israel had not been established at this point. Five times we see this word, Lord, in these five verses. It is not an implication whatsoever that God Almighty is limited by physiology or, an, or anatomy. There is no implication there. He is still and always has been and always will be the omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent God. I think what you see here, though, is language that is uh, uh, almost a mocking, a taunting of the puny work of humans thinking that they can build something up that would make a name for themselves that meant anything. So verse 5 still says, The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of man had built. Came down. Now, this did not happen. Okay, I want you to understand, this did not happen. But somehow it's, it's, in, it's in my head that, you know, we, we have God on his throne in heaven, and, and I, I picture this little messenger angel coming up and, 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 and pulling on his robe and says, God, look at what these humans are doing down here. And he says, where? And the little angel says, um, down there. He said, well, why don't we play a game of hot and cold? And, okay, hotter, hot, I still don't see it. Hotter, 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 hot, hot, hot. Still don't see it, still don't see it, still don't see it. It's that insignificant. And yet it is tremendously significant in their intent, which was to rebel. Now, that did not happen. God sees everything. But I just see this, this picture of how far he had to come down to see the most magnificent structure that humans could have invented at that time. Way down. Psalms 113, 1 through 7. This is one I would highlight in my, in my Bible if I were you. Praise the Lord. It's Psalms 113, 1 through 7. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Not my name, the Lord's name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. From this time forth and forever, from the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high, listen to this, verse 4, Psalms 113, the Lord is high above all nations. His glory is above the heavens. So even if they had succeeded, which we know that they could not do, in getting near the heavens, it says right here, His glory is above the heavens. He is so far up there. Who is like the Lord our God who is throned on high? And this, I think, is the crux of this verse. Who humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. God has to humble himself. He has to condescend. Not just to see things in the earth, to see the things in heaven. He is that almighty. That magnificent, and human ingenuity is that puny, that puny. 
Think about this when you think of God's love and how just amazing that is. Psalms, one, uh, Psalms 11, 4 said, and this, some, of you may, some of you may have this one highlighted. It's a pretty famous verse. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. See that? His eyelids test the son of men. Now, there's two popular uh, uh, theories or, or, or thoughts about what this means. His eyelids test the sum, sons, uh, sons of men. One, mean, one says he has to squint so that your eyelids are exposed. He has to squint. He is looking that microscopically at every detail that's going on, okay, to test the sons of men, to see what we are doing because he loves us. Another plausible explanation has to do with sleep. When are eyelids most prominent? When you're asleep. When you're asleep. So it's also possible that when we think God is sleeping, He is even that much more attuned to what we're doing. He's right there with us. He sees everything, and it concerns Him what we are doing. But regardless of this, says very clearly, the Lord has come down, way down, so far down, to observe this little construction project. And Moses is trash-talking. Did they complete their task? Well, it's pretty clear they didn't complete the city because the, the follow-on verses says that they ceased building the city. Uh, but translations will say we're building, or we're building, had built, builded, have builded. This is my opinion. You won't, you, you won't find this in Scripture. But I believe that uh, the, the tower was either in the process of being built and almost completed, it almost completed the top, top of it, or maybe it was fully built, the tower. Okay? Maybe it was fully constructed, but it was already being used for apostasy, for faux religion. The city was either still under construction, or maybe they had designs on making it even larger, and they were enlarging the city, but we know that it was not completed. Okay? And if you look at biblical art, and I'm not going to show it because I think it's actually more confusing than anything, uh, the way biblical art is, but a lot of times you will see a cylindrical tower, this, you know what I'm talking about, this circular tower that, that goes around, you know, like a, almost like switchbacks up, up a mountain, and then sometimes we'll have the, the top left off, okay, and sometimes you'll see clouds floating around at the midpoint of the tower. That's kind of the biblical art situation. I think it's way more likely you're looking at something much more rectangular or square. In verse 6, we get the divine inspection report. You get, you get God coming down and, and inspecting. The Lord said, Behold, they are one people, they have the same language, and this is what they began to do. And now nothing which they purpose will be impossible for them. So you see, they are one people, they are organized as one people, they are utilizing the same language. And what did they decide to do with their unification? Open rebellion. They've been told what to do. Fruitful, multiply, multiply, populate the earth, move. And they decided to settle and glorify themselves. Now, the phrase, nothing will be impossible for them, some people hang on this verse and say God is threatened by this. God is not threatened by their activity. This is no challenge at all to God's sovereignty, which is absolute. He's not scared. He's not the slightest bit worried in terms of what type of construction project they're doing right here. The key word here is purpose. Go back to, go back to verse 6 where it says, And this is what they began to do, and now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. See, what does God know about us? We're sinners. We're sinners. He knows what we will purpose to do when we are left to our own devices. And what are their purposes? They tell you very clearly what the purposes are. We reject God. We have antagonism towards His command. We say, nope, nope, nope. Well, God is well aware of this. Isaiah 59, 7 says, Their feet run to evil and they hasten to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity, devastation, and destruction are in their highways. That's sinful man. That's what we purpose to do. 
our per- left to our own devices, our feet run to evil and shed innocent blood. Romans 3.9 says, and this is, this is very convicting, and this actually I would link to the, the, the story about um, how I see myself in the Tower of Babel population. Romans 3.9, beginning in verse 9, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already been charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. You see, that's a quotation right there. Destruction and misery are in their paths. That's an allusion back to Isaiah. And the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's humanity. That's the world view. So what would we purpose and left to our own device? Exactly what Paul is saying in the book of Romans here. And while I'm on this, next week, uh, if you want to do a little bit of homework uh, for it, I'd ask that you maybe, uh, if you've got a moment, uh, check out uh, the first chapter of the book of Romans because we will uh, more than likely lead off from there. But the key to this text is God understands that they would run to the fullest extent of apostasy when given the chance. If there aren't constraints, if there isn't in divine involvement here, if there's not restraints put on them in some form or fashion, their intentions, their proclivities, their direction, their purposes would run contrary to God's will. And his love and his holiness would not abide that. His purpose for creation would not abide that. Ultimately, his redemptive plan through his son Jesus Christ would not abide this. So if you're ever asked, and this gets asked quite a bit from people who are seeking, do you believe that humans are inherently good or inherently bad? Well, since God is the standard of goodness, I have to say, absent the justification of Jesus Christ, a personal relationship with him that where our, 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 our garments are as, uh, washed as white as snow, bad, bad up until that moment. Verse 7, come, let us go down. There's mimicry of their language, remember? Come, let us build. God says, come, let us go down. And there confused their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. You have mimicry, mockery of the language right here. You have a picture of the Trinity. This is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We're going down, and we're going to do something. So, in a really ironic way, if these people actually intended to build this ziggurat, so that the gods would come down and commune with them, they got what they wanted. They got what they wanted. Oh, God came down. He came down. But he came down and confused their language. They said, we're going to build. God says, I'm going to confuse. And he gave them different languages. He mixed them up. Now, this is where I think the awesome part of the motion picture would be if we did it right here. I want you to think about what it would be like if right now your language was different from everybody around you. (laughs) How disorienting would that be? Now, I felt this time every time I, I, I stepped into my Spanish class. Okay? Every single time. And Dr. Dutton started speaking in Spanish. Okay? And, and Dr. Devereaux did the same. And I'm like, I'm supposed to be learning this. And I am not learning anything. I'm not learning anything. But the worst was Dr. Janine Randall. She was my philosophy professor. She knew seven languages but she didn't know which one to use at any given time. So in the middle of her lecture, she might be in Portuguese and then in German, okay? 
think how disorienting that we we literally have to raise our hand. We 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 don't under can you do this in English, please? Okay? I get you, Nietzsche may have spoke a different language, but we're not Nietzsche. Okay? Think just think about this. Now, think about if you're suspended up ten stories on the side of a tower putting on some finishing touches like this, and your foreman is telling you, do this, do this, do this, and all of a sudden, you can't understand him. How do I get down? Maybe you're saying, get down. He goes, I don't understand. You want to go up? You want to stay here all night? I, I mean, I just cannot imagine. Clarity became gibberish for some of these people. And think about the desperate hunt the search for people who understood you. Think about that. It would be trauma deluxe. You might think you're alone. Until you found somebody who spoke your language, you, you could be in the midst of a bunch of people and think that you are completely alone. And think about how our missionaries feel when they're in foreign lands. Okay? Okay? I do want to point this out, though, and you have to go back to the Table of Nations, one of the reasons why I wanted to go through that. When we looked at the sons of Shem and Ham and Japheth, it said that they were divided up according to their what? To their families, to their languages, and into nations. Notice this. The languages were preserved in family. The languages were preserved in family. God did not split the families up. They held the same language within the family. This is how important, critical, the institution of the family is. And we've seen repeated assaults on the value of the family in our society. And now we're seeing repeated assaults on the, very, the building blocks of that, male and female. Again, take a look at Romans 1. We'll be there next week. But that's, that's what he did. Okay? He gave them different languages. Okay? What did he take away? See, that's why I hadn't thought about this. What did he take away? He didn't make them bilingual. He didn't say you get to retain your common tongue, the old tongue, and I'm going to give you another one. Otherwise, they could have still talked in the common tongue. He took away... Their old language and gave them a new language. I prayed so much for bilingualism, but he stripped them of their legacy tongue, took away their phonology, their morphology, their syntax and semantics, did away with their complete dictionaries, did away with it just like that. And the search for their peoples began. The search for the, the run to the family began. Another note here, and this is we'll spend some time here. God did not give them gibberish. He did not give them chirps and grunts and whistles from which evolved mature languages. He gave them mature languages. He gave them mature syntax. He gave them mature morphology. He gave them mature semantics. He gave them their complete dictionary, their Oxford dictionary, their Webster, Miriam's, whatever dictionaries were there. And that's the way God works. See, that's why evolution is such an, uh, an incredibly awful theory because it attacks at the very creative nature of God Almighty. God created man and he created woman fully mature. He created languages fully mature. He, he, he created botany mature. He did not just scatter seedlings all over the earth and watch it grow. He created these things mature. And here he creates languages as mature forms and systems of communication right there. So when you are asked, which came first, the chicken or the egg? You say chicken. You say chicken. Because God creates 
mature. And guess what? When we come to a saving knowledge of Lord Jesus Christ, our salvation is not evolving. It is mature in that moment. Now, should we mature through sanctification? Absolutely. We're commanded to do that. But our righteousness before God, our justification before God, is mature at that moment. Evolution is a lie. And the reason we don't see movies made about the Tower of Babel and we don't hear people talking about the Tower of Babel is because evolutionary theorists cannot understand where languages come from. They refuse to understand that. Now some people will say, aha, the Bible is wrong here because we cannot trace human language to one language. There's not even an implication here that God decided to evolve these languages from a proto-human language, an original language. No! He said, I am confused using their language, and he gives them new languages. Modern linguistics says that there's 6,500 to 7,000 languages spoken on the earth today. We know that there's language families, right? The Indo-European languages, we actually talked a little bit about that in the Table of Nations, and obviously these will develop over time as there's assimilations, uh, there's, there, there's migrations, there's regional divisions, so on and so forth. We know that English started out as a Germanic language from the Angles and the Saxons and the Jutes, and then in 1066, a very important uh, part of history occurs. Anybody know 1066 off the top of, their, top of your head? Big battle. Had a basset hound named after this dude. This is William I, the Conqueror, the Duke of Normandy, Battle of Hastings, overruns Great Britain, brings the Norman and the French language over, and then you have this... this, this, uh, this uh, uh, migration of, of the English language. But you also have constructed languages, and you have isolates, and you have computer languages, of which I am completely ignorant. But a constructed language might be something like Pig Latin. You might speak Pig Latin. Thought that was pretty clever back in the day. Of course, yeah, we, 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 we went with Laura probably doesn't know Pig Latin, do you? You got, you got that one? That's good. All right. Um, Klingon. Klingon would be a constructed language. High Valyrian from the, the George Martin uh, series Game of Thrones takes these linguists years, years to put these languages together, okay? These constructed languages, okay? Tolkien has his own, if anybody's a Tolkien fan, the Lord of the Rings trilogy, you have the Elvish languages and, and so, so on and so forth. Those take years and years uh, for them to construct. And then we have one that you haven't talked about for a while. Anybody... Anybody remember the, the term Esperanto? Anybody remember Esperanto? It was big for a while, right? Started out, what, when did it start out? In the 1800s? Yeah, yeah. In, uh, late 1800s, they thought, we need to have a language that the whole world can speak. And so they constructed a language called Esperanto. Um, it's the world's most widely spoken, constructed, international auxiliary language, even to this day. It's estimated that 2 million people can speak Esperanto. Okay? Has nobody heard of Esperanto? Actually, I had to study this and haven't heard that. Okay, do your independent Googling on it. It's estimated that 2 million people speak Esperanto today, um, and there's only about 1,000 people who speak it natively, which means it was the language spoken in their home, and they speak Esperanto as their first language. The most famous of these thousand people, these native Esperanto speakers, this, this world-constructed language, is a fellow by the name of George Soros. Chew on that one. In 2001, National Review said thousands of human languages are heading for extinction. The 15 most common languages are now on the lips of over half of the world's people. 15 languages over half the world's people. 90% of humanity speaks 100 languages. Only 600 languages are being taught to children, so these will disappear in the next, next generation. By the end of the 21st century, if we make it there, half of the nearly 7,000 languages will be gone. Well, that's the future of language. That's what linguists say are the future of language. But I think we can see here that God is in control of languages. Is he not? And I can tell you, and we'll see this next week in Revelation, that there will be multiple languages at the end. 
and they will all be saying Hosanna in different languages. But that's the future. What do linguists say about the origin of languages? Listen to this. There's a global marketing company that I know actually pretty well. It is titled, interestingly, the name of their company is Unbabble. Their mantra is, you don't have to speak the same language to be on the same page. That's their mantra. It's building a language operations platform that helps every team across, the com a country, uh, across a company e easily interact with customers in any language, combining artificial intelligence with human editors, fast, efficient, high-quality translations that get smarter over time. Unbabble enables consistent multilingual support at scale so enterprises can build customer trust in every corner of the world. Working on it. In August, on August 22nd, just a couple of years ago, 2019, they, uh, this Unbabble uh, published a blog that says, why do humans speak over 7,000 languages? There are, however, they say, two main hypotheses that explain the origin of language and cons consequent diversity. They're wrong. There's more than two. Uh, actually, there's two hypotheses, and there's one truth. Um, the first is the belief that all languages ever spoken by humans originated in one single language that spread across the world due to humans' nomadic nature. This is known as monogenesis. Wrong. The second hypothesis is known as polygenesis and believes that the same way humans evolved parallel in different parts of the world, so did language. Each of the original languages then split into numerous different ones. But listen to this. Linguists still don't agree on a concrete answer as to why so many languages came to be. Genesis 11, Chip, that's, that would be their answer, okay? Uh, what they do know for sure is that the number will constantly change as humanity and the world changes as well. So even Unbabble says they don't understand it, okay? But that's just a marketing company. Let's, let's look what the scientists say because surely they got this thing nailed, right? Scientists got this nailed. Scientific American, September 1, 2018, article, The Cultural Origins of Language. This is a little bit long, but it says, In the 1860s, the Society of Linguistics of Paris banned discussion about the evolution of language, and the Philological Society of London banned it in the 1870s. Why would they have done that? I don't have to read the rest of the article. You know why they did that. They realized they cannot get an answer to this without going to Scripture. See, this isn't like you can construct models of fossil records and stuff like this. You're talking about human communication, and they are as confused as the people were at Babel on day one. Norm Chomsky, Noam Chomsky actually, the extraordinary influential linguist at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology was for decades rather famously disinterested in language evolution. How could this be? Evolution is the answer to everything, but Noam Chomsky is saying, I'm not really interested in that. And his attitude had a chilling effect on the field. Maybe, maybe they should have searched in a different spot. The early days of serious research in language evolution unearthed a perplexing paradox. No, duh. Language is plainly, obviously, uniquely human. It consists of wildly complicated, interconnecting sets of rules for combining sounds and words and sentences to create meaning, and it was created by God. Listen to this, though, and I love this. It's su such scientific findings from genetics, cognitive science, and brain sciences are now converging in a different place. They ain't got a place to start. It looks like languages is not a brilliant adaptation. What? It's not evolutionary? Nor is it encoded in the human genome or the inevitable output of superior human brains. It's not encoded. It's not evolutionary. Where does it come from? I would say God. Instead, language grows out of a platform of abilities. Oh, now we're going to surmise something, and I like this. Get this. Some of which are very ancient and shared with other animals, and only some of which are more modern. Well, there's you a real definitive scientific answer. Very ancient, as opposed to semi-ancient, as opposed to very, very ancient, and some of them are modern. Conclusion. In the short time since the field of language evolution has been active, researchers may not have re reached the Holy Grail. Listen to this. The Holy Grail, a definitive, a definitive event that explains language. Eee! 
Yes. But listen to this. But their work makes that quest somewhat beside the point. We're working on it. That's all that matters. We don't have an answer. We can't get to an answer. But we're working on it, so just glorify in our work. Science. Noam Chomsky, we heard him referenced. He's father of modern linguistics, MIT, renowned radical leftist philosopher, actually, says, on the origin of language, just because you can ask the question does not mean that it is an answerable question. (laughs) He says, I don't know, and you don't know either. Okay. Yeah, we do. Well, language is incredibly, incredibly important. It's the raw material of communication, okay? And we know it can be used productively as we witness, as we share Christ. We know it can be used destructively. But back to Shinar to conclude this. So the Lord scattered them abroad there from the, uh, over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. The common tongue is gone. The old tongue is gone. In its place, many languages, at least 70 that we saw in the table of nations, and the people scattered. The people scattered? No, the Lord scattered them. The Lord scattered them. Okay, how did he do it? I don't know. I'm like Chomsky on this. I don't know how he scattered them. It may be just the division of language was enough to cause them to, to, to scatter. I don't know. But, I mean, he, he, he tra- teleported uh, Philip, did he not? He could have teleported entire populations that, just like that. No, no problem there. I don't know. Reminds me of the day that I was teaching a college and career class, and we were talking about the Lord will come again at a time that no man knows. And I tell you, within seconds of concluding the the prayer there, two ladies came up and said, so when do you think it's going to (laughs) happen? I probably gave an answer. I don't know. I don't don't know what I was like. Oh, my. This, This lesson didn't land. But um, they got their name. They got their name. You see that? They got their name. Babel. Meant confused. Meant confused. They stopped building the city. They were removed from the side of their precious tower, removed from their rallying point, but they got their name. The Akkadians will take the name and change it. The Akkadians will take the name Babel and they will change it to the gateway to the gods. And folks, that's where we'll pick up next week um, as we study Mystery Babylon and the worldview that emanates from Babel through the end times. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the privilege of studying your word, Lord. We thank you that you are sovereign God. We thank you that we can communicate with each other, Lord. Forgive us when we misuse that communication, Lord. Uh, so many times we are warned in Scripture about uh, the, the, the power of the tongue, the power of our words. Uh, may our words be used to build your kingdom, not to tear it down. We pray a special blessing on the service that will follow. Stand on your promise that where two or more are gathered in your name, there you will be also. For it's in Christ's name we pray.